I work with e-commerce every day, all day. It's kind of what I do. Um, that's my Twitter handle, at slash one Andy. Uh, a bit about us. This is our team photo from our most recent, re wow, most recent Woo trip. Um, we had a Woo conference in San Francisco. It's in Austin this year. So if you guys are interested in e-commerce, this is the place to be. Uh, so WooConf. And uh, in this picture, they told us to act like a ninja, because that's like our mascot, the ninja. But I was already being Batman there in the middle, so I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go with it. <laughs> so <laughs> um, about WooCommerce, uh, we're the number one e-commerce plugin for WordPress. We power approximately 30% of every online store. So it's kind of a, it, it's a it, people don't realize how much of a market share that we actually have. And this is 30% this is of every online store. That's, that's a pretty large amount of, of uh, stores. Um, so you can see it's kind of broken up. There's like WooCommerce, and then there's like WooCommerce 2.2. And so I haven't actually updated the graph. It might be more, um, but I haven't updated it in a, in a couple months. So um, it's like an unwritten rule in every tech session that you have to like mention Legos or have Legos in there or something. So I like Legos and Star Wars and Star Wars Legos. So also prerequisite. I get to have a cat picture, but I don't like cats. So here's my Airedale. <laughs> She's not that cute anymore, but you know, I love her. So a bit more about me. We'll keep it brief. I love WordPress, or else I wouldn't be here. Um, I've been working with it since 2008 in some form or fashion. Uh, I worked for a nonprofit for seven years before coming to WooThemes, and then Automatic in the acquisition. Um, I work in payment gateway support for WooCommerce at Automatic. So let's get down to it. The number one tip for people accepting payment online is this, respect your user's data and treat it as your own, right? It's like the, the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So if you get literally nothing, this is the TLDR for you, okay? Just write this down. Respect their data, treat it like it's yours, and protect it. So here's a quote by me, it's all about trust getting your users to trust you, and then not betraying that trust by securing their info. Um, so user trust. Uh, this is a, you'll see some graphics through the next slides, and they're all from the same report. It's put out by UPS in the holiday season last year. They did a massive survey of commerce in general, and then broke it down based on like e-commerce, you know, mobile commerce, in-store commerce, all these different things. So that's where these uh, graphics are coming from. Um, so user trust is huge, right? You're getting someone to give you their credit card information online. Like not too long ago, that was completely taboo. Anyone who did that was a shyster trying to get your money. Like everyone that did that not too long ago. And so we've come a long way in that. Um, we, you know, you can see over here, they surveyed people and they said, e-commerce, do you trust it? 69% said their trust remained the same year over year. So the 2013 holiday season, 2014 holiday season, they were about the same amount of trust. You know, they trusted it, that's good. So 18% said their trust increased over the last year. And then 13% said their trust decreased. And so that, that orange little slice there is what we gotta work on, right? There are people who are trusting e-commerce in general less and less. Um, and, and we're winning the battle. The store owners are winning the battle because the trust is increasing over, over time. As people become more tech savvy and used to shopping online, it's, it's normal now. Um, so people trust e-commerce platforms as a whole, but they're, the flip side of that is they're also becoming more discerning as to where they place that trust. Because the bar has been set pretty high by places like Amazon, Zappos, eBay, all this stuff, right? People trust them. Um, so there are a lot of factors to user trust, and I'm gonna go over some non-technical ones and some technical ones, but we'll try to keep it pretty light um, so it's not super technical. There's like, I think one line of code in this, so don't get frightened. Um, so like I said, there are many factors, technical, non-technical. We're gonna go over some of them. Card abandonment. Card abandonment is what happens when you don't have user trust, right? Now, there are a lot of factors. It doesn't all have to relate to user trust, but approximately 42% of customers, on average, never get past the first part of checkout. They add something to the cart, and they never proceed from there. They never enter their shipping details. They never proceed to billing, nothing. There's a huge barrier to getting uh, customers to actually give you money. 
So that number, the 42% can tie into a lot of things, and we're going to cover a lot of them. Some of them we're not going to. Um, people abandon carts based on um, their trust. They, based, they do it based on the shipping costs. They do it based on what payment processors you use. They do it based on um, whether you ship via their favorite preferred method, right? So some people are like, oh, I want UPS. I want Canada Post. I want USPS. Um, having to pay a sales tax. I don't know how it works in Canada, but in the US, it's very um, different. Uh, you don't have to collect sales tax on other people, other states' purchases. So I don't know how that works here, but if you have to collect sales tax, like people are like, oh, I don't want to pay sales tax on that. Um, so we're going to optimize the checkout process. So these are a couple um, bullet points. They're, they're thoughts, really. Um, tear down the sign-in barrier. Uh, if you're trying to get people to give you money, make it as easy as possible, right? So don't make them have to create an account unless that's something you really need. Like it's a subscription plan or something. Obviously, they're going to need an account, right? But if it's just you're selling t-shirts, why do you need them to create an account? Some people are like, oh, I need the, I need the account. They're going to come back. No, they're just never going to buy from you in the first place. Um, so don't disconnect your customer from giving you their money. Um, customers actually can resent being forced to create an account if they don't want to create an account. Some people don't mind. A lot of people don't mind. But you're trying to get as many people as possible, right? So provide a progress indicator. So by default, um, WooCommerce doesn't do like a multi-step checkout. Like it's all on one page. You got your billing address, shipping address, order notes. We're all right there. So you don't actually go through steps. But a lot of places um, and some themes that use WooCommerce um, will actually do like a multi-step checkout. So you enter your billing address, click next. Enter your, your shipping address, click next. Enter your payment details, click next. And so that, I, I personally don't think that's a good idea for most businesses because it creates a barrier that they have to click three times to get through, right? So every click you're going to lose someone. So if you do that, that's fine, right? It's your store. Do what you want. But provide a progress indicator so people actually know how long this thing is going to take. So you're on step one of four, step two of four, step three of four, right? And so that way you're losing people, you're losing less people. Um, how many of you were in the e-commerce 101 talk last, last night? Yeah. Okay. So he talked about matching the checkout with your site's look and feel, right? He mentioned um, that he totally stole it from me. Just kidding. Didn't. But um, <laughs> so a lot of like the third-party hosted um, solutions like Shopify and stuff, you, you do your cart and everything on your store, right? So like I'm, I'm browsing for hair care products, and I'm looking, and I'm doing this, and they have a green background. And it's all cool. And then I, I have my cart, and I hit checkout. And all of a sudden, it takes me to another URL, something.shopify.com. And then it says um, it's completely white. And I'm like, whoa, what the crap? What just happened to me? Because it doesn't match the, the shopping cart that I was just at for an hour browsing hair care products. And so uh, I'm picking on Shopify, but a lot of p places do that. And a lot of people even do that on their own site. They make the shopping cart and the checkout look nothing like their site. And that's very bad. Because people, people, you're catering to everyone, right? So like, I'm going to know, OK, the URL didn't change. It's the same site. No big deal. But is your average user going to know, oh, wait, everything looks different. What, what happened, right? And so people are a bit paranoid now. Um, with <laughs> where they put their credit card information. So don't, don't give them anything to make them pause and make sure that they're on the right site, make sure that they're correctly checking out. Never send your customer outside the checkout process once they're actually there. So back in the day, uh, probably 10 years ago, Zappos did a uh, checkout process that you would go through, you'd punch in your billing address, you'd punch in your shipping address, and then you'd hit next, right? And then it would come to a page that said, um, you want to create an account to save your information for later. Yeah, why not? Hit the button. And it would take you outside of the checkout to the account page where you'd go create an account. And then you'd have to go back to the cart, then go back through all the steps of checkout again. And then they realized, oh crap, we're losing like 20% of the people that click account. Like it's huge. That's a lot of people. Um, so don't do that. Um, keep them in your checkout, right? So like, I, I'm, I quote a lot of things from WooCommerce because that's what I'm familiar with. In WooCommerce, um, if you select, yeah, save my information for later, it literally just, there's a checkbox. And then you hit checkout, and it saves your information for later. It creates an account for you. 
Um, and then the last one, visually reinforce all sensitive fields on the payment page. And we'll go over that with the slide. So Smashing Magazine did a study, and they found out that what people are looking for to indicate that it's secure is not actually really have anything to do with security. So people love padlocks, right? Everyone loves a padlock. It's secure. So if you see a green padlock in your, in your address bar, you're like, okay, cool, right? It's secure, SSL. And people also love to see padlocks on their credit card forms. They love to see padlocks in footers. Like, people just love padlocks. So just give them padlocks, okay? To get anything else out of this. The TLDR and padlocks. So there's a clear divergence between what actually is secure and the customer's mental model of security, right? Um, so people didn't actually think about security until they went to type in their credit card information. You can get any other information from them. And, and then as soon as they pull out their card, they're like, oh, crap, wait, hold on, make sure it's HTTPS, make sure there's a little padlock, make sure everything's good to go. Okay, we're good. So one test subject said uh, it didn't look safe enough. Her reaction wasn't actually based on technical security at all. It was based on her gut check, her feeling. Um, there's the link if you're interested, and you can type that fast because I'm about to switch slides, so have fun. Um, but you can see over here, there's some things, like padlock. This is their credit card form that they said worked really well. This had the highest conversion. Padlock. They also said that telling people what, what's happening, giving them more description. So secure credit card form, secure 128-bit SSL, 16 digit on the front of your credit card, and then they give them little uh, icons. And then all these different information, right? So that's actually going to help you if you have the ability to implement that. Um, something similar, anything that tells the customer what you've already implemented, right? So don't put a padlock and say it's encrypted if it's not. <laughs> Please don't. Um, so payment options. Um, I typically recommend three payment gateways, Stripe, PayPal, Amazon Payments. And um, there's, there's a uh, varying reasons, and I'll go into that here shortly. Um, so Stripe is a credit card processor. They do, um, you get your account with them. They handle all your transactions. They give you the, the API key to plug into WooCommerce or Shopify, wherever, right? So uh, PayPal, everyone, who does not know what PayPal is? Exactly. Who does not know what Amazon is? Exactly. OK. Um, so the reason I love Stripe is because it's completely extendable, um, and it's very, very, very secure. It's probably the most secure um, payment gateway that's on your site. There's a couple others. Moneris is really good. Beanstream is pretty good. Braintree. Um, but if I had to pick one, it'd probably be Stripe. Um, and yeah, so Stripe offers a thing called tokenization. And um, it's very similar, like if you were to check out at Amazon, you can save your card for later, right? That's awesome because it enables a lower barrier for them to give you more money later. So what it does is it doesn't actually save the credit card information to your site. The, the credit card details never touch your site. They go straight to Stripe servers, and then they give you what's called token. And you can use that token to get more money from them later. Um, so there's a lot of implications with your payment processor of choice. So it's the place that your customers are trusting to be safe with their info, right? They're trusting you, and you're trusting the payment gateway. So you've got to make sure that, that they're legit and that they are actually secure. Um, not only do you have to not only do you have to be completely trusting that they won't betray your trust, but your user does too. Because a lot of times they'll know what's going on, like PayPal, right? So you go to PayPal site, you know you're paying at PayPal. Stripe's a bit different, unless you have like the Stripe checkout branding or something. People don't know it's Stripe. But um, it, a lot of times it enables you to like uh, leverage that, that brand recognition of PayPal, Amazon. Um, and different, different gateways have varying security methods. Some are better than others. Um, I'm going to cover SSL fairly in depth a little bit later, um, but you do need um, so that SSL encrypts the traffic between your server and the customer's browser. So um, if you had something just like PayPal where it goes offsite, you don't actually need an SSL to encrypt the payment information because it's not there. But I highly recommend that you still have one because they're still giving you their address and other personal information, and there's no reason not to have one. So, um, but uh, there, I have a couple slides on SSL here coming up. Um, so 
<laughs> one time I ran across, uh, so in WooCommerce support, I log into customer sites if they have issues, right? And I fix their issues and go on our merry way. So I log into this customer site and I realized that they have this gateway and they're taking cr customers' credit card information and it's called the WooCommerce Offline Payment Gateway. It's not made by us, okay? It's <laughs> and what it does, uh, there's actually a couple versions. They made it more secure, which it's still not, so don't ever do this. Um, in the old version, it would literally email the, stop, the shop owner in plain text the customer's credit card information. So the new secure method is we'll email half of the credit card information to you in plain text and we'll store the other half in plain text in the database. That's real secure. It's not, by the way, that was sarcasm. Don't ever do that. <laughs> No, no, <laughs> they're not PSAC compliant. They're not even close. So how do they even get the pros of the credit card information? Um, so PCI compliance is a complicated beast, right? So most times you can actually process a lot of credit cards without actually being PCI compliant. However, you should never do that. You should always be PCI compliant. And you're supposed to be PCI compliant, but it, the policing isn't there. So, so yeah, that's how they did it. They had a terminal in their physical store, and then they would run it through that because it was cheaper or something, or they just didn't want to change. I'm not sure which. Didn't ask because at that point I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> so um, on-site processing. This is what I was talking about with Stripe. One of the methods I mentioned earlier, Stripe, um, it's what we call an on-site gateway. It means that the customers stay there, right? So billing details, shipping details, payment information. You punch in your credit card right there. Uh, Amazon is also an on-site processor, but it's a bit different than Stripe, so I'm gonna talk about that here shortly. Um, so SSL, I mentioned it a couple times, it stands for Secure Socket Layer. Uh, it provides a secure connection between the browser that the user is using and your server. Um, and then you can transmit data back and forth it's decrypted, you don't have to worry about it. And uh, sites secure the SSL have the green padlock that we are talking about. Uh, and then they actually, if it's an EV certificate, which means they verify that they're like a legit business and all that stuff, they could have like a name there, a green bar. That's what that means. It just means that they went through more steps to prove that they're actually who they are, rather than just that it's encrypted. Um, so with any kind of on-site processor, if someone is entering credit card information on your site, you have to have an SSL certificate. Like there's no exceptions. Um, even if, we'll get into this in a minute, uh, even if the server, the details never touch your site, you still have to have that. Like, you have to have it. Um, if you have a WooThemes extension for an on-site thing, we actually require you. The, the gateway will not activate until you have the SSL correctly um, in place. So kind of a safeguard for people who don't know. You know, like, oh, I should get an SSL to it. OK, cool. Um, so Amazon. Uh, well, let's go back to Stripe, actually. Stripe is a bit different than, uh, as I was mentioning, it has a thing called Stripe.js, uh, so it's a JavaScript file that is integrated with our plugin. And what it does is it hosts the form fields for the credit card on Stripe servers in an iframe, and it sends it directly to Stripe, never touching your server. So all the billing and shipping and everything goes to your server, the credit card details go directly to Stripe server, and then Stripe says, hey, they paid. So way more secure than a typical uh, payment, on-site payment gateway. And it means you can qualify for PCI DSS AEQ, if I remember correctly. We're getting on that in a shortly. But it's, a, it's a way easier to get PCI compliant um, than having something like, um, well, I don't know, but another credit card processor that's on your thing. Um, so Amazon, Amazon takes their, their credit card information, their billing, shipping address, and it displays it in an iframe on your site. So also, you don't have to worry about security so much with Amazon because they're doing it. It's all from Amazon. There's no, the, no data actually touches your server again. And then PayPal, the same way. You go to PayPal, you punch in the information there, so you don't have to worry about any of that either. It's great. Not worrying is great. So offsite processing, that's like PayPal. Um, it means that your customers are going to another store or another site, punching their credit card information and coming back. So this is the easiest to implement typically, an off-site payment gateway. 
because you don't have to do anything. You're literally offloading all responsibility for the payment security to the payment processor itself. And typically, like with PayPal in WooCommerce, all you need is your email address that you register with PayPal, and you type that in one field, and you're done. Like, that's it. It's so nice. <laughs> um, It, it depends. It varies wildly. <laughs> like it really does. Um, and so something else to consider is like your industry. Um, so like Stripe is fairly uh, strict about like what they'll do. So um, like e vaping stuff, they won't touch. So if you're like doing the vaping, selling the juices and whatever, they don't touch that. Um, and, uh, and quite a few other categories. Um, and a lot of payment processors do. If, like if you're selling like artwork or whatever, you're probably pretty good. But if you have anything that might be questionable, check with their terms of services before you get shut down. <laughs> um, and that's, that's they, everyone has their own little, we don't do this, we don't do this, we don't do this. Um, I've, anecdotally, I've heard that um, PayPal tends to be on the higher end, and Stripe is also a bit on the higher end than something like uh, an authorized.net or something like that. Um, and authorize.net has a great service too. I'm not disparaging any that I didn't mention. Um, that's just the ones that I've had great success with. And, you know, that's, I really like what they're doing. So, yeah. Um, so, sometimes when you have an offsite processor, you have an issue with card abandonment because, like I mentioned before, you're sending them outside of your checkout. With PayPal, it's not so much because people recognize PayPal. They've been there before. They know the site. They know the brand. And chances are they trust PayPal more than you. So it's actually a good thing to send them off-site because they're like, oh, PayPal. I, I trust PayPal. I already have a PayPal account. You know, I already have my credit card stored. So you're making it easier for them because all their information is already in PayPal. And you're providing a, I call it trust by proxy, right? So I trust PayPal. Therefore, I trust this guy's site because he's using PayPal. So um, a lot of people don't like PayPal. That's fine. That's why I say like have a couple different payment methods, just because people are picky. And if you don't have my favorite payment gateway, like you know, some people literally won't check out with PayPal. That's fine. You know, but offer it. I would say there's no reason really not to. Um, so PCI compliance, payment card industry data security standard PCI DSS. It's a set of rules that all companies that process payments via credit card, whether that's online, offline, anywhere in between, you have to be PCI compliant. And that means different things for different markets, right? So like uh, online obviously has a set of rules that offline stores don't. You don't have to worry about server security if you're running a mom and pop, you know, swipe it here. Um, but everyone has to have this Verification. It's, it's a group of credit card companies, Visa, MasterCard, all the big ones, came together and said, hey, this is what we're going to do to make sure that people are using this securely. It's going to limit our reliability, it's going to limit everyone's liability. So self-assessment self questionnaire AEP is where you want to be. I intentionally did not rhyme. Or I rhymed in, unintentionally. That was what I was looking for. So, uh, it's much, 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 much less strenuous to go through than like an audit. Because <laughs> an audit means they have to come in, they look at your server, they look at every single piece of code you have on your server, they look at your physical security, so where your server is located. Like they're hardcore about PCI compliance and security. The AEP is you literally check a box that says, <laughs> I don't store any or transmit any security information. Check, we're done. All right, your PCI compliant. No, I just want my note because I, I did it for a website for a client. We were asked, uh, I think it was 850 questions uh, for a client. And that's yeah. all we had to do. Yeah. And I was back and forth with the PCI and couldn't figure out what was going on. And all I had to do was that. And but my client was freaking out because they answered 800 different questions that were subject to normal rules. And it's one of them. Thanks for that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That. Yeah, for sure. So. If you can do this, all the gateways I mentioned before will qualify for you for this AEP because the, the credit card details never, ever touch your server. So that's the important part is now you're pushing the PCI compliance burden off on Stripe, PayPal, and Amazon. So you don't actually have to worry about any of this. It's <laughs> I hate PCI compliance. Like I, If I could never touch that again, I, I would be happy. Um, 
If you, oh yeah, if you have a credit card breach, if you are having user information, you have a credit card breach, you will be fined and it will not be pretty, I promise you. Like, um, it's something that they don't play around with. So like if someone steals credit card information from your site, if you're storing them insecurely or whatever, um, yeah, you're gonna get fined and it's not gonna be cheap. Um, so security is important. So I mentioned that before, Stripe, Amazon, PayPal, you don't have to worry about it. So that's the theory of like user trust and kind of what it means and we're going to get into some technical stuff. It's not even really that technical. It's not scary. Don't, don't freak out on me. So do have a clear user-friendly privacy policy. It's very important. Um, having users know what you're gathering, why you're gathering it, and what you're going to do with it, extremely important to users. And it actually might be required in your jurisdiction. I don't know. I'm not from Canada. Sorry. Um, but check with your local thing. Actually, don't even check. Just do it. Literally, just do it. Uh, just have a privacy policy. Make your email list. Everyone wants to market via email, right? Because it has an insane ROI. Like, you get your money back really quickly. But make sure that you're doing it correctly. Your email list should be strictly opt-in, and it should be double opt-in. Yeah. What's that? Canadian law. It's you have to opt-in. Do you have to do double opt-in? Yeah. Good. Good. OK, well, in the US, people can still get away with single opt-in which is not okay. I don't like that. Use an SSL on every single page. Notice the caps. Every single page that users are giving you information. Um, so checkout forms, login forms, signing up for email marketing, everywhere. Use an SSL. It's really not that hard. I'm going to go over that here shortly. And there, there's no exceptions. Like You should not have somewhere where someone is typing in their information that's not encrypted. Because that means that if you're logged into Starbucks Wi-Fi, anyone on that Wi-Fi network can find anything that's over HTTP. It's just how it works. Um, don't. Okay. Some people obscure their privacy policy. They hide it in the footer, like in tiny links, or they make it so you have to jump through like six pages to find their privacy policy. That's a huge no-no. Um, just don't do it. There's no reason to. Be upfront with people about what you're gathering their information for. And people are legitimately um, concerned about it, but they understand, okay, I'm buying something online. They need my shipping address, back, my billing address. People know the, the, the drill, right? Um, so it's a bad idea to mail people without their permission or to sell their information to others or give. Can't give it either. It's the same as selling. Don't do it. Um, so protect your user's data. One of the worst things you can do is have a credit card form on a plain HTT page. And so there's two, there's two stories I'd like to tell you now. You guys have Capital One credit cards up here? No? Yeah? No. Yeah, okay. So I went to log into my Capital One credit card to pay my bill. And being the um, slightly paranoid security focused nut I am, I checked everything, right? I looked up, <laughs> and in the address bar it said HTTP. I was like, what are you doing, right? I was like, okay, crap. So I, I typed the S in, HTTPS, capital one.com. Hit enter. And I got an error, an SSL error. I was like, what? So I looked at the little, uh, the little error message in Firefox, and it said, the SSL certificate that's for this site is wrong. It's configured for very select subdomains. So it's www.capitalone.com or there was a couple others, like their help site and stuff. But if you just went to CapitalOne.com without the www, it didn't redirect. So you literally had no SSL on CapitalOne.com. And so I, I was like, OK, well, this is crap. So I, I tweeted at them. I was like, hey, um, you should get this fixed right now. And they're like, um, no, nothing's wrong. <laughs> I sent them like screenshot after screenshot after screenshot. I was like, I can show you exactly what's wrong. I can send you a video on how to fix it if you'd like. Like, you know. So I tweeted at him again, and then like I got a DM that message back, and they're like, "Can you uh, can you tell us you know how how to replicate this?" I was like, "Sure. Go to your website and type S in the address bar, HTTPS, and you'll see it." And um, like it went on literally for three days before they fixed this. Like that's how terrible it was. Like mind blowing. Like you are one of the largest credit card issuing companies in the world, and you can't get this right. And it's not that hard. Like it's really not that hard. <laughs> Um, and then another one, I was buying something um, online for my beard, my beard care products. <laughs> and so I went to check out and I realized, so we found them because they were using WooCommerce. And I was like, hey, this is cool. Use WooCommerce, sell some beard care products. 
And I went to check out, and it was HTTP. I was like, what the crap? And they didn't have an SSL certificate at all in place. And so like, I messaged them, and it literally took like four days again. Like, it's, it's really not that hard. So take security uh, very seriously. If someone tells you there's a security issue, ask a developer, or if you're comfortable enough, just fix it. Like, there's, chances are, if it's a plugin that's not insecure, they're going to have an update out for it already. Or if it's what you're doing, it's fairly easy to fix, typically. So just be careful. Privacy policy. Have a privacy policy. I mentioned that before. I mentioned it again. Just do it. Um, it's, it's literally a majority of small business owners that don't have one. They assume, well, I'm not big enough to need a privacy policy. False. If you sell anything online, you need a privacy policy. If you take any money online, you need a privacy policy. Um, so just be careful with the police. Like, people don't understand it. They don't read it. They don't want to read it. Um, and make sure that, that users are retaining their right to privacy. So don't ask for, for crazy information like, hey, what's your gender? How much does your household make? Nobody needs to know that. It's not pertinent to what you're doing. So don't ask questions like that. It's going to increase your um, chances of actually getting the information, and it's going to minimize your burden because you're going to have less information about them. Um, so automatic does. Um, uh, a open source privacy policy. So if you go to our automatic.com, you can look at our privacy policy. And you can take that word for word, change out your company name for automatic. So it won't say automatic anymore, say your company, and you're good to go. It's open source. So you can take our privacy policy, modify it how you see fit, and go from there. So you don't even need a lawyer. You don't need anything. You just grab this privacy policy, modify it how you want, and you're good to go. Um, the FTC in the US has a lot of information on privacy and um, kind of what best practices are for that. Um, so I'm sure you guys have something like that in Canada. Um, but tell users why you're collecting the information that you are and describe how you're going to use it. Right? So you're co we're collecting your email address for the express purpose of emailing you when your order ships right? or whatever, whatever it is. Um, so tell people about cookies. That's a good thing. Um, tell people. Uh, what is personally identifiable? So like if you have, if you have cookies and stuff, um, that's typically not personally identifiable. But if you have like account information, obviously that's personally identifiable, right? You got their username or their real name, their address, everything. So yeah, personally identifiable. Um, explain how long you're going to keep the data. Explain how you collect the data. And also, big one, tell people when you're sending their data to someone else. A lot of times it's legitimate, right? You're using a credit card processor. Well, they get the information. You're using a shipping service, a drop shipper. They need the information. Your, um, you know, um, whatever else you might use, tax, tax uh, calculations, they all need information. Um, and then provide contact details in the privacy policy to let people know, hey, if you have a problem with our privacy policy, just contact us. No big deal. Mailing list, double opt-in. I, I recognize that, or uh, I mentioned that before. So that means that uh, you get an email after you sign up. You get an email that you also have to click a link in that double confirms that you actually signed up and not some prankster signing you up for a bunch of email addresses. Um, there's a lot of guidelines to email marketing that you should look into. Um, in the U.S., we have something called the Can Spam Act, um, which means you have to put like your your full address in the footer. You have to do a bunch of stuff. I'm sure, there's stuff like that for Canada and. There we go. I found that a reputable email service like MailChimp or Constant Contact or something, they're typically handle, they'll be on top of that for you. So um, yes, look at the regulations. Use a reputable service because A, they're going to handle a lot of that for you. B, they're going to have a way better delivery rate than you ever will from your server. Um, and because people are going to like spam stuff, they're going to say, hey, this is spam. Whereas it's, it's a, lot less like, or a lot less likely to get caught in a spam filter from uh, somewhere like MailChimp. So 
why all this work? Giving the, cus the customers power to make decisions based on what formation you have and what you're going to do with it is always good for business. Um, people like to feel empowered. And it's not just feeling empowered, it's actually being empowered. So you want your customers to feel empowered, able to choose, know what's happening with their data. It's important. Knowledge and transparency equals trust. So if they know what you're doing and you're open about it, they're going to trust you more. So SSL, the TLDR. Purchase and install an SSL certificate. Update your site URL in WordPress. Force HTTPS throughout the site. Resolve any insecure elements on your page. Update Google Webmaster Tools and Google Analytics. This is for if you want to have your whole site over SSL, which is probably a good idea, honestly. Um, so it's, uh, this is definitely not a uh, comprehensive guide. It's, like I said, it's pretty much the TLDR. So if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them later, or you can look them up. Um, I got a lot of information on this from the Give website. It's a nonprofit donation thing, and they have a really good guide on this. So you can purchase your SSL certificate from your host and have them install it. It's typically the easiest way to do it. Just they, they do everything, right? You send them 100 bucks, and they do everything. Um, use httpslessencrypt.org. It's a free initiative from, uh, it's by the Linux Foundation. It's sponsored by Mozilla, Cisco, and Automatic, among others. Um, and they literally want people to encrypt their websites, so they provide free SSL certificates. It only works with Apache currently, and I'm not sure if there's plans to broaden that, um, but that's what it currently works with, Linux, Apache. Um, and then there's a command that you would run on that. Um, do it yourself, it's slightly masochistic, but hey, if that's your thing, have at it. And then call me when you're done, because I want to know how you do it, because I don't touch that stuff. Um, so in, your, in WordPress, in the general settings, there's a blog URL and a site URL. Uh, and you would change both those to use HTTPS. And that way, WordPress knows that that's the correct URL to go to. Um, and then you can use WordPress force HTTPS. That's a plugin. And that will force everything over HTTPS. Uh, you can also do it with uh, .htaccess rules if you'd like. Have fun. Um, I'm not going to write it for you, so find them somewhere. Or, um, <laughs> But this is the easiest way, by far. Just the plugin, you hit install, and it does it automatically. In fact, I like to say automagically. So, if you have mixed content, um, typically that means your theme or your plugins have hard coded HTTP links, which is a big no. But you can use better search replace for database stuff, like post pages and stuff. And you can search, uh, replace all HTTP with HTTPS in the post and post meta table. And then uh, your theme and plugins, like I mentioned, could be causing that. And if you can't fix that with like a child theme or something, then you might be better off just switching themes or plugins because that probably means they didn't follow other best practices. Just my two cents. Security. Um, no talk on user trust would be complete without talking about security, right? So a breach of your site that uh, leaks information is never good for business. Um, it's a complicated topic and there's no magic bullet. So I'm not going to guarantee anything, but you are far less likely to be compromised if you follow these steps. The easiest one, keep everything updated, all the things. If you see an update, do it. Okay? There's no reason not to, really. Make sure you're backing up. Make sure you have a current backup before you do this, but keep your themes, your plugins, and WordPress updated. There's a reason that they update. It's not just to add a new color to your theme. Like, you know, there's, there's legitimate reasons. Keep them updated. Um, the number one source of hacks is actually old software. So keep that in mind when you don't want to update. It's the number one source. The number two is stupid, idiotic, short passwords that you use a million times. So use strong passwords. Seriously, please stop using your cat's name. It doesn't work. It never has. Um, change the username from admin or other easy ones to guess. So don't use your site name. That's also easy to guess. Um, your database username and passwords are also at risk. Uh, most times you don't ever see that unless you manually install WordPress, but you can check it in your WP config file, wp-config.php, and you can see what they are. And if they seem like really short or easy to guess, uh, you can change those. Just check with your host, I would recommend, before you do that. Um, disable file editing from the WordPress admin. So like, you know, you can go to customize and you can add in PHP or CSS or whatever you want from the admin. It's bad. Okay, I've done it. I'd still do it. Don't do it. Um, 
just don't do it. Um, so you can add this line, define, disallow file edit true. You can Google that. Uh, I wouldn't really try to write it down. It's, but you can Google that. And that will disable that customized menu. So if someone gets access to your WordPress backend, they can't, still can't modify your files. So you're isolating, right? You're just providing layers of security. So the biggest one is the passwords. Usually and password are sometimes the weakest link in your security. Um, most people have stupid ones, like honestly. Um, you, I cannot count the amount of times that I've seen people with password one, two, three. That's never worked in 15 years. Like it, it's never worked. Um, so brute forcing means that they, uh, a hacker tries to gain access to your site using mad amounts of <coughs> usernames and passwords. They just go through thousands and thousands and thousands, millions and millions and millions, right? And so there's ways to fix that. Um, but uh, the easiest thing with passwords is the best way is to make a password that you can't remember. Because if you remember it, it's probably easy to guess, either from like social engineering or via um, brute forcing. So security plugins, prevention, scans, and backups. That's what they do. Uh, they, do can, they can do a mixture of them. Some do prevention and backups. Some do prevention and scans. Some do, you know. So it's pretty simple. Prevention obviously keeps the hackers out, right? Scans, checks for hackers that are already there. Backups, make sure you have a backup that you can restore to if for some reason your site gets hacked. Um, so they're pretty, they're pretty straightforward. So some of the security plugins. Um, Jetpack is not a security plugin, but it does have security plugin features. Uh, it has brute force protection. Um, it also integrates with VaultPress, which is a service from Automatic, my company, that you can sign up for that uh, will back up your site and scan for security vulnerabilities as well as already malicious code. Uh, WordFence is a really good one. They, do, uh, they have a firewall around your site. They, do, um, they lock out IPs if it gets too many um, attempts in a certain time period. iThemes Security, there's a gentleman from iThemes here in the, at the conference who actually heads up iThemes Security. So if you have questions about security, either them or Security, who is also here, you'll see them wearing a security shirt. They're really great to talk to. Seriously, if you have security questions, Find out Aaron Gamble, who's head of iThemes Security, or any of the guys and girls wearing security t-shirts. They're the experts, right? I'm just giving the talk on it. <laughs> just have a question. Um, like the security of WordPress in particular, are there conflicts with those? Do they do? Yeah, I wouldn't. Thing? Yeah, I would not run multiple. Yeah, um, one should be enough. Like they, they, and they do like varying different things, right? So one thing I like about security is they actually have like a proxy that um, will eliminate like DDoS attacks as well as provide some caching. And so you should actually see a performance boost on top of protection. It's pretty cool. Um, so if you're really serious about it, like uh, I would say security probably is, yeah. It, I, I, so yeah, I, I would be weir wary of having, it's like having two antivirus programs on your Windows PC, like you just don't do it. So. Um, I ask security. They're here. There's like five of them. So just ask them. You know. Thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's those are the four that I've used that I recommend. They're good stuff. Um, hosting. So your host plays a critical role in your security, right? Because you can build a rock solid site on top of a pile of quicksand and it's still going down. Um, never pick a host that starts you out on PHP 5.4 or lower. Uh, or excuse me, lower than 5.4. 5.4 is okay, still old. If you can, you should be on 5.5 or 5.6. But if you're on 5.3, like seriously, if they can't upgrade you, get out of there. Um, also, if they, uh, if, they <laughs> if they send you like FTP and they don't have SFTP credentials that you can log in with, run. Because you do not want to use FTP. FTP means you're sending all your credentials over plain text. Like it's not encrypted at all. So FTP is bad. SFTP is good. Remember that. Um, so your host actually should have firewalls in place. They should have um, some kind of uh, uh, security measures in place for you. Um, they should have the correct file permissions already set up for you. Um, shared hosting is cheap, um, but you've got to be wary because it depends on how the host is set up. But a lot of times with shared hosting, if one site gets hacked, it leaves open a way for everyone to get into your site because it's on the same server. They've already gotten the server. So it's one of the unsung dangers. People don't know about it a lot, 
But um, in this case, if it's shared hosting, a lot of times your, your security is only as good as the worst person on your site's security, and they can be pretty bad. So VPS is probably a good way to go, or something like a managed hosting. Um, so that, that's my recommendation. Use good code. Pick plugins and themes with good support behind them. So if there is a security issue, typically they're fixed before you ever know about them. Um, and that's one of the benefits of having a premium pl plugin or theme. Um, there's a lot of good themes out there and plugins that are free. We have free themes and plugins. Like there's nothing knocking free themes and plugins. However, typically the support on them is lacking. Um, and because the developer does it as a side project, right? It's just something free that I release. I'm not making money off it. I can't rush out and fix everything on it. So if, you, if you're paying for a theme or plugin in WordPress, that means you're paying for updates and support. So use them. Um, if you have a question about your payment gateway, I'll answer it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, that's my job. Like, uh, yeah, I'm here. So um, the, the important thing is to make sure that they're being regularly updated. Um, limit external uh, connections. So recently, um, anyone here T-Mobile subscriber? T-Mobile? No? OK. All right. All right, sorry. So in the US, there's a, there's a cell phone carrier called T-Mobile. And recently, there was 15 million people's credit, or, uh, not credit card, but their personal information leaked, right? And the reason it was leaked was not because T-Mobile had lax security. It was because the credit card bureau, the credit uh, report bureau, uh, Experian, was hacked. And Experian was the credit check people for T-Mobile. So T-Mobile sent their information to Experian, which has documentation on pretty much everyone in America, by the way. So it's not just like, you would expect that they would have good security. However, they didn't. They got hacked. 15 million people, uh, personal information is gone. So be careful who you entrust your user's information to. Um, sometimes you use third-party solutions, and that's great. Like, uh, it's awesome. It's drop shippers, uh, you get your pre processors, accounting, um, you know, if you use invoicing. Um, things that don't relate to your store can potentially have access, right? So like you use. Uh, Jetpack Manage or um, the other big, you know, Manage, manage This. They, typically, they'll have access to your database and or plugins, your, your files, right? So that's something you've got to keep into consideration is, do I trust these people? Should I trust these people with all of my users' information? Because that's essentially what you're doing is you're giving them the keys to the kingdom when you connect your site to another service. Make sure you investigate who has what of your site's data what their security is like, what their privacy policy is like, et cetera. Um, and just remember, if something happens to your user's data, even if it doesn't happen on your site, it happens on someone else's site, your users are blaming you because they gave you the data, not Experian, not anyone else. So I'm not saying all this to scare people because it's not that scary. If I scared you, I'm sorry. Um, it's not that scary. It's just steps to take so it doesn't become scary because what's scary is when you have a data breach and you have no customers left. Um, so hopefully, I give you some steps to prevent that from happening. Again, the number one tip for people accepting payments online is respect your user's data, treat it as your own. I'm slash one Andy at WooThemes at Automatic. If you're interested in e-commerce, we tweet about e-commerce frequently. Um, so even if you're not using WooCommerce, we have tips, tricks, how to market, everything. And then at Automatic, we tweet like random stuff. I don't even know what we tweet from at Automatic. It's, Kind of we don't tweet that much from there, but you know it's cool to follow. So, uh, and I typically tweet like really random stuff, like the food I'm eating and like pictures of my dog. So, there's that. Uh, any questions? I heard a yes. I don't know. Okay. Are you speaking from experience? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, they're up on SlideShare already, and I believe they should be up on the website. Yeah. And I will. We're going to be pulling them into yeah. the website. And then I will tweet the link out from my personal thing as soon as I'm done here. Um, and if you have any questions, you can hit me up on Twitter.
Um, yeah, you had a question. Okay. Okay, so it's in your root of WordPress. It's wp dash or a hyphen config dot php. Yeah, wp dash config, c o n f i g, dot php, and uh, so you can open that in like a code editor, text editor, and um, you'll be able to see the username and password there because that's what WordPress uses to connect to the database. Yeah. Anyone else? Oh, that's the least amount of questions I've ever had in a presentation. Uh -huh.